Allison Secular. Dr. Allison Secular is the Sandra Rotman Chair in Cognitive Neuroscience and President and Chief Scientist of the Baycrest Academy of Research and Education at the Baycrest Center for Geriatric Care and President and Chief Scientist of the Center for Aging and Brain Health Innovation. A graduate of Pomona College and the University of California at Berkeley, Dr. Seculars holds faculty position in the Department of Psychology at the University of Toronto and uh, the Department of Psychology, Neuroscience and Behavior at McMaster University. The research uses behavior, behavioral and neuroimaging approaches to understand how the brain processes visual information with a specific interest in face perception, motion processing, perceptual learning, neural plasticity, aging, and neurotechnology. The research was the first to show conclusively that older brains rewire themselves to compensate for functional changes, and her clinical and translational research aims to develop methods to prevent, detect, and treat age-related sensory and cognitive decline. She has many leadership positions. Just a few to name are she chairs the NCIRCA Public Impact Value Proposition Committee, the Ontario Hospital Association Research and Innovation Committee, serves on the governing and advisory boards for Hamilton Health Services, Vista and Brains Camp, and is a founding steering committee member of the Canadian Brain Research Strategy. Dr. Secular has won many national and international awards for research, teaching, and leadership, including serving as the country's first Canada Research Chair in Cognitive Neuroscience, being named one of the WXN's top 100 most powerful women in Canada. And if that's not enough, in her spare time, she is proving that you're never too old to learn. She picked up her first drumsticks a few years ago, joined the band, and recently earned her drum professional certificate. She, and I highly suggest everyone to make sure that you're following her on Twitter because there's nothing that you cannot learn from her on Twitter or learn about what's happening on the Twitter from like wonderful books, what is the best tea of the day and is changing every day and all the other fun things and scientific things that are happening around. I really don't know how she manages to be an excellent and outstanding person in so many areas, but she is outstanding and wonderful and a perfect mom. And she knows everyone in the world, I believe so. So with more, without any further ado, I will invite Dr. Secular to start her presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Azadeh. And we have a mutual um, affection society going here. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. I think um, incredibly highly of, of you and all of the work that's going on at Kite. And thanks, Babak, also for uh, inviting me and arranging the, the lecture today. Um, and uh, in case you're wondering, the tea of the day today is a, a very, it's a, a late spring green tea um, from Japan. That's the tea of the day today. And I can talk more about that in questions if people are interested. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you mostly today, though, about vision science uh, on the brain uh, and some of the work that we've been doing over the last really couple of decades in foundational and translational research in aging. And um, of course, all of the kinds of things that Azadeh was talking about wouldn't be possible without a very large team. And um, this is just, um, you know, sort of showing that people who've been involved in some of the things that I'll be talking about today, uh, collaborators and funders. Um, and I'm highlighting in blue uh, three of, of my most core uh, collaborators, uh, Pat Bennett, who is based at uh, McMaster University, and we run the uh, Vision and Cognitive Neuroscience Lab together. Eugenie Rodea, uh, she's at Baycrest, uh, and we run the Visage Lab together, or in French it's Visage, uh, and Robert Schooler, um, who is both my father and one of my long-term collaborators. And he's really the person who got me into vision and aging research in the first place. So if you don't like what I'm talking about, you can really send my dad a note and blame him. Happy, happy to give you his email address. 
So why, why are we talking about vision and aging? Well, the concept of what happens as we get older has been really quite negative for, for a very long time. You can see in this installation piece by Gilles Barbier, who is uh, an artist out of France, uh, this piece is called Los Bis. And, and what you can see here is that even superheroes don't fare well in old age. And it's not a new concept. This was a, a piece from 2002, but even Shakespeare and As You Like It wrote, the last scene of all that ends this strange eventful history is second childishness and mere oblivion, sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste, sans everything. It's a very bleak view of aging and it's understandable because throughout the ages, people have known that as you get older, some things start to fall apart. And one of the things that does happen as we get older is it becomes more likely that people will be impacted by dementia. Once every three seconds, it's estimated that someone somewhere around the world is going to be diagnosed with dementia. And um, this is a, a global phenomenon and, it, it, and it's growing uh, year over year. And even if people don't end up with one form of dementia or another, um, there are other things that can go wrong as we get older. One of the things that's very common is changes in our vision. Uh, and I don't mean just needing um, reading glasses. I mean, changes in, in the properties of our eyes, for example, that lead to either age-related macular degeneration, glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, or, or cataracts. And as you can see, age-related macular degeneration is when you can't see what's right in the very middle where you're looking. So that's exactly what you want to see best. Glaucoma causes some problems in the more peripheral side of vision. So you can see where you're looking, but you can't see what's in the periphery. Uh, cataracts, what you'll see here, kind of make everything a little bit blurry and, and fuzzy. Uh, and diabetic retinopathy, um, of course, is when uh, diabetes leads to changes in the structure of the retina itself. And you can have little patchy blind spots that appear. These are actually very, very common ailments. Um, so age-related macular degeneration impacts more people than Alzheimer's and Parkinson's combined uh, in Canada. And, um, you know, cataracts can be uh, treated, but not everything else can necessarily be treated. So there, there's quite a lot to know about how aging impacts vision. And even if you're not impacted by this, there are there are other kinds of changes in the visual system. And so we what we really want to do is to understand what is healthy aging like in terms of vision and where can things start to go wrong? And that's what I'll be talking about today. Because what we'd like to end up with is not the kind of decrepit superheroes that you saw in Barbier's installation piece, but we wanna see what we can do to, to create more real world senior superheroes. So people like Ernestine Shepherd, who's shown here when she was 80, um, she started bodybuilding in her 50s and loved it and then became a champion uh, weightlifter in, in her 80s. Uh, and she's uh, still active today. Uh, and um, Eva Kurtzman, who is confined in this case to a wheelchair, but she's also, I think, a senior superhero because she's continually learning and she's living her best life. And she said, as our first valedictorian of Baycrest Later Life Learning Academy, you're never too old to learn. So our goal really is to understand how do we go from this to Eva or Ernestine? And what can vision tell us about what healthy aging looks like? So first of all, what happens in healthy aging? Um, in aging, uh, and when, when I say healthy aging, I, I mean aging where there's no uh, retinopathy, there's no um, uh, neuropathy. So in this case, um, we're talking about people who are aging as well as they can under, in the case um, uh, without neurological disorders. So when, when we've been looking over the decades at really basic elements of vision, uh, what we see is that the most standard basic elements of vision, so what size something is, what orientation something is, what direction something is moving, there doesn't seem to be too much of a deficit linked to aging. Um, or if that deficit comes, it comes quite late in life uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's relatively small. So basic early level vision, so vision that might rely on earlier levels in the occipital, occipital cortex, for example, they don't seem to be impacted too much by aging in general. Where we start to see bigger effects of age uh, is when we start looking at more complex 
aspects of aging. So things like face identification, things like contour integration, things like visual attention. So whose face am I looking at? Um, where does one object end and the next begin? Um, how do I perceive things in clutter? Um, what's happening if I've got to attend to multiple things at the same time and pick or pick something out from a cluttered environment? Those more complicated kinds of visual processing are where we tend to see bigger effects of aging. And so I'll be talking um, at first about some of those and I'll come back to this issue of why we may not have so many problems with our more fun foundational elements of, of vision science and why we think that can actually tell us something about the aging process more generally. So to start off, I just wanna say that this concept of different kinds of vision changing it in different ways is not a new one. Uh, one of the authors of the um, NRC report, Work, Aging and Vision back in 1987 said, said it, I think as, as well as possible. So that's the quote that I love, which is just plain seeing in simplified situations as in routine vision testing seems as good and as quick as ever, but perceiving the meaning of a complex changing scene is definitely more difficult and slower. So this person was highlighting the fact that basic vision or you know, simple vision doesn't seem to have any sort of uh, difficulty, but when it's a more complex scene, it's more difficult. And you, this, this mirrors what we hear in hearing, I should say, and I can come back to, get to, to that in the questions people are interested as well. So people will say, I, I can hear fine, but when I'm in a crowded environment, I can't hear as well. So this is the same kind of, of concept. And it really comes back to what is happening in the optometrist's office versus what is happening in the real world. And you may have heard, you know, if you're older yourself or your parents or your grandparents say, you know, I just, I feel like I can't see as well, but my optometrist says I can see fine. And what is that disconnect? Uh, so this is just showing one of the kinds of tests you might take if you go to your eye doctor, uh, what we call a smell and acuity chart. And uh, the scene on the right is a, a scene from Banff, uh, someone taken from the perspective of someone who's driving. Um, and you can see they're very different kinds of situations and they differ in terms of a couple of different features. So in the doctor's office, you know, they might say, which lens is better, one or two? There's really no time limit. You can take your time. You can, you can sort of you know, go back and forth and back and forth and, and really try to figure out what those letters are that you're looking at. There's not, time isn't really of the essence. Whereas if you're driving, timing is really critical. And I think the folks at Kite know that better than anyone, um, given your amazing driving simulator, uh, that you know, if, you, if you break a little bit too late, it can really cause damage. And you know, the, the timing that it takes for you to be able to search a scene for a cyclist or for someone who might be coming out from behind that tree, uh, that's really critical. Um, the other thing that's different is that you've got relatively clean scenes in the doctor's office. So yes, there are a lot of letters here, but you know exactly um, you know, it's a black, black letters on a white background. There's only that one task that you're doing. And, and it's a pretty clean uh, sort of stimulus. And it's a clean scene. In the case of the BAMF scene on the right, which is our example for the natural world, those sorts of scenes are noisy and they're cluttered. If you could see what my, my real desk and surroundings look like right now, you'd be amazed that I can find anything on this desk. Um, it's, it's just covered with papers and um, you know, my water here, my tea over here. How do I find things in these kinds of scenes? And the same thing is true in, in our driving scene. As I said before, there's actually a pedestrian hidden behind that tree and the tree is hidden behind the stop sign and there's, there can be fog, there can be rain. So these are noisy and cluttered scenes. In the doctor's office, you're usually just doing one thing at a time. So you've just got one single task. In this case, what letters do you see on the third row or what letters do you see on the fourth row? And you also know, there's only a limited set of letters that they're gonna be using. Um, so they don't usually use W, for example, in these. So you can, you can kind of make some guesses about it. It's just one task at a time. And you've got really good information about the task. In the real world, you're doing multiple things. You're trying to um, know, navigate uh, you know, with your Apple Maps uh, at the same time that you might be listening to music. Uh, and you also have to make sure that you're stopping in the right place and you're looking for the pedestrian who might jump out or a car turning or somebody who might be exiting from that van on your left. There's a lot going on all at once. You're really effectively multitasking. So it's a much more complex set of tasks for all of these different reasons in the real world versus in uh, a doctor's office. 
And we've tried to probe this using behavioral methods as well as um, neuroimaging methods. And um, a lot of the work I'll be talking about is using electroencephalography. This is an older system that we used before. This fellow uh, was 92 when we were testing him with this particular system. And this actually was his birthday. Uh, so we've got some other pictures of him wearing a birthday hat over his EEG uh, cap. So um, what EEG does, as many of you know, is try, try to figure out what's happening inside the processing of the brain by measuring the electrical potential on the scalp. And we've, we've come at this from a couple of different perspectives, as you'll see uh, throughout the talk. Um, in, in this particular case, we were asking that fellow and a bunch of other people to be able to do a face discrimination task. And so what you see here is sets of faces. Uh, if you look over on the right-hand side where it says 100%, you can see the clean faces. So this is two female faces, one on the top and one on the bottom. And what we've done is you go from the right over to the left, uh, is to scramble the phase of the, um, the stimulus. So we can take these images on the right and do a Fourier decomposition on them, and then take the phase information from those, scramble that, keep the contrast the same, spatial frequencies the same, orientations the same. So we're just scrambling the structure, if you will. And what you can see is it looks like sort of unstructured information. And really what we were looking at here was how, do, how much information, how much structural information is required for older people versus younger people to be able to tell the difference between two faces um, and what's happening in the brain while people are doing this task. And I'm not gonna go into a lot of the details about this, any of the next few studies too much, and I can answer questions later, just to give you sort of an overview of the kinds of things that we're finding here. And in this case, what we found is summarized uh, by this slide, which is showing effectively the extent at which the, the bulk of the information is being used to be able to do the task. Um, and so where, where you see red, that's sort of the peak of the information for doing this kind of a task. And what you can see, if you look at the top versus the bottom, is that younger people versus older people, younger people are much faster uh, at doing the task, um, at, at gathering the information to be able to complete the task accurately, I should say. Uh, than older people. So it's about 150 milliseconds on average for the younger subjects to accrue the right amount of information, but it's it's closer to 250 on average for the older. But there's also a lot more variability amongst the older people. So already we can see there's some differences in, in how individuals behave. So in this particular task on the behavior, what happened was older people did a little bit worse, but they didn't need a lot more of that structural information to be able to perform a task. But what they're doing is they're needing more time to be able to extract that information to be able to successfully uh, complete the task. So that shows again, this issue of timing that the older brain is a little bit slower and if it's a little bit slower for every single thing it's doing that could potentially be having some sort of an impact. Um, we've also been able to examine this uh, sort of change in this processing speed of older brains versus younger brains using portable EEG. In this case, it's a, a Muse device from a company called Interaxon, and I've got one here. It's just this, um, it's a portable EEG system. So unlike the system I showed you before that had 256 electrodes, this one has just four. It has a couple uh, in the front, and then there's some embedded in the earpieces behind here. And there's another version that's actually quite useful for sleep, um, Azade, I think uh, does some work with that one as well. And what, uh, what we do in this case is we just, actually are using data from people who have bought one of these devices um, and they were using it to perform mindfulness training tasks. And what we were able to do in partnership with the Interaxon company is to extract all of the data uh, from, in this case, it was about 6,000 participants uh, across the ages of 18 to uh, 80, 88 or so, and, um, and look to see what happens when people are using EEG in the wild, so in their homes, um, and how different parts of the spectrum, the EEG spectrum, uh, change with age. And what you can see here is just a sample of, of the data that we got from this study, and this was at, the, at its time, the largest EEG study that was ever published. To do this kind of study in the lab would take basically an entire career um, to run 6,000 people. So um, I'll come back to this issue of wild neuroscience a little bit later on. But really what we, what it's interesting for us to be able to see here is that if you're looking at the 
um, frequency um, at which you've got a peak in one of these um, elements uh, sort of the Fourier decomposition of the, of the EG signal, in this case, the alpha peak, you can see that the frequency is getting um, uh, slower uh, as you go from younger to older. Um, there's a lot more going on here, um, obviously, and uh, there's differences between the electrodes in the front and the electrodes sort of behind the ears. We actually see some, some sex differences that would be impossible to see in the lab because we wouldn't have the power to be able to see that. And, um, you know, but what's really nice here is that we had so many participants that we don't have to compare just young versus old. We can go decade by decade by decade and see, yes, there is really a slowing of the brain uh, in, in a number of different ways, not for everything, but in certain elements, uh, it's certainly slowing. Um, and, uh, you know, so again, timing is a really critical element then for the older brain. So timing is critical. What about clean scenes versus noisy and cluttered scenes? The way we've approached that is in a couple of different types of experiments. In one, we used what are called biological walkers, uh, which, which were established back in the 70s, where people basically initially just taped lights to people's joints. So the wrist, the elbow, the shoulder, and so on, and then filmed them in the dark. And uh, these are computer generated versions of those same kinds of elements. So there's just you know, a scattering of points that are linked to certain, uh, you know, the head, the neck, shoulder, elbows, et cetera. And what you can see is that the person appears to be walking on a treadmill. Uh, and the task is a really simple task. In this case, the person just has to say, does it appear that the person is walking to the right or to the left? And so if you look at the person on the left, uh, so the clean sort of a scene, uh, it should be pretty easy for you to see that the person is walking to the um, to the right. And uh, once we start throwing some noise on top of this, we're adding some clutter now to the scene. Uh, it, it might be a little bit harder for some of you to be able to see that the person here is walking to the left, um, or it may be not hard at all. And, and why is that? It might depend on your age. So in this case, what we found is that younger people when there is no clutter, can basically do the task at 100%, they're pretty good. Older people, um, um, oh, sorry, I'll show you a second. Younger people, once you put the clutter on top, they're still at, at about 100%. So the noise, if you're a younger person, in this case, this was sort of 20 to 30, uh, don't seem to be really very much affected by the impact of that noise. Older people, when there's no noise, are just as good as the younger people. But once we throw that noise on top, all of a sudden their performance declines. So noise is having a much bigger impact on older people being able to see this simple task, left versus right direction of, of a complex um, stimulus. Um, and younger people don't seem to be impacted by it. We've also looked at these kinds of tasks, which are shown on the bottom here, where you have a number of uh, what are called Gabor elements, uh, which are these sort of these uh, black and white uh, oriented gratings, if you will. And what you can see if you look at the bottom left is that there is a spiral that sort of starts in the middle and then curves around and then ends in the bottom sort of pointing over to the bottom right-hand side. And uh, what we can do, and there's actually a spiral in each one of these and it's oriented in a, a slightly different orientation in each of them. And what we've done is to increase the clutter as you go from left to right. And what you can see in the graph of the accuracy results, uh, one is the least amount of clutter and two is the highest amount of clutter that we tested. And uh, there's some different um, other conditions that are thrown in here too, so you don't have to worry so much about those, but just look at the um, uh, red for older versus the black for the younger. And what you can see is that, you know, whether you're comparing the, the squares to the squares, um, or the circles uh, to the circles. Um, what you can see is that uh, the with relatively little clutter, there's not too much of an aging effect. But once you start adding more and more and more clutter, older people start being more and more impacted by that clutter. It's harder for them to be able to tell what direction is that that spiral facing. So in this case, also what we see is that older people are being more impacted by the noise, by the clutter than younger people. So 
we've got timing is critical. We've got older people more impacted by noisy and cluttered scenes. What about this other element of multitasking? The way we've addressed this is looking at a divided attention task called the use of field of view, uh, which my father developed back in the 80s. And uh, you know, we take a variant of this task. And in this task, we just ask someone in, the, in one basic condition to say, a letter flashes up, was it an E, an F, an H, or an L? It's a focused task where you're just looking at what's in the center. Or we can do a focused task where you just have to focus on what's in the periphery. So a spot flashes up in one of these locations shown by the open circles. And then there's a mask afterward in both of these cases. And they just had to say, where is the spot? Which orientation, which direction is it? Uh, sort of, you know, nine o'clock or 12 o'clock, et cetera. So you can have either just telling me where is the spot in the periphery, that's the focus peripheral task, or what is the letter that you saw in the fovea? And I can also be really mean and ask you to do both of those things at the same time. And this is our divided attention task. And in this case, for various methodological reasons, we always had them do in the order of the center task first, and then the peripheral task, and then do both together. And what did we find? Uh, what we're gonna be plotting here is the, the error when you're making the, the decision under divided attention conditions versus when you're making it under focused attention conditions. And we'll plot uh, from left to right the age uh, from younger to older. Um, we test this over uh, the adult lifespan from about uh, 15 up to um, 85, 90. And so zero here means that you're just as good when you're dividing attention as when you're focusing your attention and a positive number means you're actually doing worse when you are dividing your attention compared to when you're focused attention. And of course, a negative would mean you're actually doing better. Uh, what we see with the letter task is that it is consistent across the age. This is where you just say what letter flashed in the middle. And you'll notice it is a little bit lower than zero. And um, so you're actually doing a little bit better in the um, divided attention task than a focused attention task. And there's various reasons for this. And as I said before, we always ran focused first and then divided. Um, so uh, they, they may be a little bit of a practice effect, but the main thing that's important here is that there's no age effect. Um, performance is consistent across the age. When we look at the peripheral task, where was that spot? What you can see is that decade by decade by decade, people are getting worse and worse and worse at dividing their attention. It looks like they get a little bit better or they level off at the oldest age group, but that's just because they really couldn't do the task at all at that point, even under focused attention conditions. So it's, it's starting at about the age of 15, your ability to divide your attention on this kind of task gets worse and worse and worse. And why is that interesting? Well, it's interesting because that's actually shown to be related to driving. Uh, so um, when uh, people have a, a poor, what's called use of field of view, so how much information can you take in at one time under these kind of divided attention conditions? Um, effectively, what we found is that um, the reduced divide, uh, use of field of view in aging turns a scene from this into sort of a scene like that. And you can imagine that now everything's gonna be a little bit harder uh, to be able to um, see, is someone jumping out from behind that tree? Is somebody going to be uh, you know, stepping out uh, from that van if a car is turning? And the use of field of view is actually a good predictor of certain kinds of accidents, not driving in general, but certain kinds of accidents where things are happening in a rapid way in the periphery and you may miss them if you're dividing your attention. So what we see then is that multitasking um, is also not doing as well for older people compared to younger people. Um, we we um, now have these three different elements. So timing is critical, noisy cluttered scenes and multitasking that help us we think explain a little bit about why, you know, when my grandma used to go to the optometrist, she would come out depressed because she's, she, she was thinking this person can't help me. I can't see but they say I'm fine. And it's because there is this fundamental difference between complex sorts of tasks that you do in the real world versus the kind of tasks that you're completing in a doctor's office. Now, coming back to the issue of these really more basic fundamental elements of vision, size and orientation and direction and so on. Um, why, why is it, we wondered, that they seem to be preserved when these other kinds of visual processing are, are starting to decline with age? And to examine that, um, we did a really basic kind of a task 
where we just ask someone to say, here's one grading, one set of bars, and here's when we'll show another one. Uh, here's a second set of bars. Which set of bars is thinner, right? So in other words, um, which has the higher spatial frequency? So uh, if I show you this first, and then I show you this one, it should be pretty easy for you to know that the second one is the thinner set of bars. Um, and then I can show you this versus this, and that might be a little bit harder. Um, in this case, the first one was the thinner set of bars. But what we've done is we have changed the uh, difference in the size of the effect. So this is about a 10% difference in the spatial frequency, and the other was a much, much bigger difference. And so what we wanted to know is, how well do younger people do on this task versus older people? What's the minimum amount of a difference that they need to be able to just distinguish those bars to create a just noticeable difference in those sets of bars at a certain criterion level? Uh, so I'll say 80% correct. And um, so what we, what we did uh, was actually to run this kind of study while we had people uh, in, uh, in this case, it was positron emission tomography scanning them. This was done back in the late 90s. Um, and uh, so it was, you know, making use of, of CAMH's uh, PET scanner at the time. And what we were doing was looking to see how younger people and older people performed on this task. And what we saw was that behaviorally, they were identical. We could not tell the difference in performance for younger people versus older people. So if I looked at a data point, a, a performance a threshold, let's say for what's the minimum amount of bar difference someone needs to be able to tell the difference between the first and the second interval, I would look at a threshold. I couldn't tell you if that was an older person or a younger person. But when we looked at the patterns of activation across the brain, and this is work that we did with uh, Randy McIntosh and Cheryl Grady and uh, Natasha Raja um, and my father um, and, and a, a whole slew of others, um, Pat Bennett and others. What we found in this case is that the patterns of activation across the brain were quite different. And in this case, if you look on the left side, those two brains are showing what's happening in uh, younger brains. And if you look on the right side, that shows the pattern of activation and connections within the right, within the older brains. And what you can see is that um, if you look, say the bottom left, uh, the younger brains seem to be relying most heavily on pathways that were in occipital cortex, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, so the back of the brain here, because that's where basic vision is happening. So v area V1, the, the first visual area, um, you know, where we think a lot of basic processing for motion and size, uh, orientation and so on, that's really in the occipital cortex. And so it makes sense that younger people are relying on that. When you look over to the bottom right, you can see those red arrows become quite weak. Uh, and what we think is happening is that the, the network that younger people are relying on has weakened as we get older. And if you look, go up to the upper right-hand side, what you can see is some really strong red arrows there. And that shows what we think is happening in terms of the pathway to solve this task, if you will, in older brains. So, um, and in particular, what we're seeing is there's a lot more activation and integration into this network of areas like the hippocampus and prefrontal cortex, which in younger people, we normally would associate with things like memory and attention. So this was sort of the first time really that, that, that it was able to be shown that older brains are really rewiring themselves to compensate uh, in some way for um, performance. So that, um, and the reason we say that is because in other tasks there had been shown differences in brain activation between younger and older, but there was also a difference in performance. This is the first time performance is the same, but the activation um, patterns are quite different. The wiring patterns are different. And that got us thinking, well, um, you know, is it, is it the case that older brains can actually um, come up against some limitations of this compensation? If, if they are in fact recruiting potentially um, parts of hippocampus, parts of frontal cortex, prefrontal cortex to do a vision task, that's fine until you have to remember something or until you have to um, attend to something. So it's like you've got two bank accounts, one for your everyday food and uh, clothes and uh, you know the occasional movie and one for your dream trip to Hawaii or wherever. And if you run out of money in your everyday account, you can borrow from your Hawaii account. But if then you try to book a trip to Hawaii, you don't have any money there. So then you run into trouble. So it may be that the, the easier foundational kinds of tasks are fine because there's not a lot of other 
complex constraints that are on what direction is something moving or what orientation is something. But once you start getting into things like face processing and you're bringing in the need to recruit other areas beyond occipital cortex, um, there might be memory for who, identity um, or you know, other, other kinds of things going on in those more complicated areas, you might come up against the limits of the compensation. And that made us think that maybe we can use visual changes to predict who is going to be at risk for cognitive trials. Um, so issues in neurodegeneration. So um, it, it is already you know, known that there can be changes in the structure of the eye, um, particularly in, in the retina um, and, and other markers of the eye um, that accompany the onset, for example, of Alzheimer's disease and accompany in Toronto uh, that we work with through the Center for Aging Brain Health Innovation called ReadySpec is doing some work on that. They can take a picture of the eye and be able to sort of predict who's at, who's at risk uh, for dementia. What we're talking about here is not just the structure of the eye, but the function of the eye and the function of the brain. Um, so can we, can we actually, looking at what's happening in performance for people um, who uh, are healthy older versus people with mild cognitive impairment or even early Alzheimer's, is there a difference in how people perform on different kinds of tasks? And so that's really what we were getting at in, in this sort of work that we're, we're doing now at Baycrest. And what we're trying to use there is vision to be able to predict cognitive decline. So I've already described a number of these sorts of tasks. So there is a face identification task. And what we've done here is to take our traditional task where it might be an hour in the lab and you know hundreds and hundreds of trials and turn them into five minute sorts of very simple tasks that can be then ported onto um, an app on your phone or, or on an iPad or whatever. Um, so that people can actually be doing them at home. And, um, and I'll come back to why that is in, in a moment. Uh, but so these are just basic tasks and I've tried to simplify them as much as possible. So a face is shown on the top, um, looking either just to the left or, the, or to the right. And you have, you're shown then two faces on the bottom. You say, which face did you see? That's, that's it. And in this case, the answer is the face on the left. I think I'm almost prosognosic, so I'm really bad at this task. Uh, so I think it's the face on the left though. Um, the middle one is that contour task that I was talking about. So where is the tail? And in this case, we've simplified it. So the tail is either um, facing to the right or facing to the left. And again, we're varying uh, the amount of, of uh, clutter that's in that scene. Um, the motion coherence task that I'm showing here is uh, you know, a bunch of dots look like they're coming at you. This is optic flow. And it's either going just to the right or just to the left. And you have to say, which direction are those dots looming? Is it to the right or to the left? Okay. And the reason we chose these tasks and a number of others is because we thought that they would help us not only determine if somebody was showing early signs of neurodegeneration, but these kinds of tasks in the past have also helped us to differentiate among different types of dementia. So Alzheimer's disease is just one type of dementia. There's also Lewy body disease, there's frontotemporal dementia, there's um, Parkinson's dementia. There's a, whole, there's a whole series of these. So uh, people typically think about Alzheimer's, but there's multiple kinds. And what we know, for example, is that um, if we had a biological uh, motion task as well, um, and we either had just the standard one where it's, is it moving to the left or to the right, or one that's got an emotional component, um, and in previous work, it had been shown that um, uh, areas uh, you know, beyond the uh, superior temporal sculptus, including frontal gyrus and, um, and other areas um, were implicated in, in processing these kinds of stimuli. And frontotemporal dementia patients were found to have specific deficits in processing the emotional component compared to people, for example, with Lewy body disease or Alzheimer's disease. So we think that this, collection of tests will not only be able to um, help us identify who is at risk for dementia, but maybe even be able to sort of see which path of dementia people might be heading down. That's the hope um, that we, if we'd be able to use it for early detection. Um, and again, in this particular case, we were making use of that Muse device. Um, it doesn't have to be Muse, it can be any portable device. We just happen to be using it. And um, the reason we're, we're focusing on that is again, our goal is to be able to turn this into an app that can be used in people's home or in a doctor's office, make it as easy as possible for folks. And uh, you know, so we wanna just first show that 
we could get you know, good signals um, from these and we would be able to use these sorts of devices to get the same kinds of measurements that we could get from um, the in-lab uh, sorts of stimuli. Um, and we have been able to show that. So for example, in a face identification task, um, if you look on the, on the left-hand side here, um, what you can see is an um, evoked response potential uh, for uh, face, a face discrimination task or face identification task. And what you can see is that there is um, a negative going potential at around 170 uh, de uh, milliseconds, 150, 107 milliseconds. Um, and this is uh, for an older adult uh, in, um, who has uh, sort of no normal cognition according to the measures in our memory clinic and uh, can perform the task pretty well, 85% correct, and shows this nice, you know, sort of uh, negative going peak. And the N170 is, is what we would typically see um, in our uh, $250,000 EEG system as opposed to this $250 EEG system. So we're able to get these kinds of um, e what are called ERPs or you know, fine-tuned markers um, of face perception in this case. What you can see on the right is the same sort of task, same analysis, but now somebody who's been diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment. And what you can see is, is twofold. The amplitude is, is coming down. It's not nearly as large, um, but also there is a shift, so it's slower. The person's also in this case worse. So only 72% correct on our particular uh, task. So it's not an impossible task by any means, um, but we do see a performance difference as well as this EEG difference. Um, when, when we are looking at the basic kinds of um, aspects of vision, so how well people can see depth, um, what's their visual acuity, um, how well can they see small things at different contrast levels. Uh, what we see here in um, the lighter colors are our normal controls and the darker colors are the mild cognitive impairment group. And you can see there's there is really no difference in the performance um, or really in the range. So again, it, can, it is consistent with this idea that basic sorts of vision um, is preserved at least with at least through mild cognitive impairment. Um, when we start looking at these other kinds of tasks, um, that's where we start to see more interesting things occur um, in terms of differentiating between people who have healthy aging versus mild cognitive impairment. And what you can see here is the way we did the clutter task, as I said before, you just flash up a target and you say, was the tail headed to the left or the right? And we vary the amount of clutter um, based on someone's performance to see how much clutter can they tolerate. And um, so what you can see on the left-hand side is the threshold density, which means higher means more clutter and lower means less clutter. And you can see instantly that you've got a, quite a large difference in the, in the behavioral performance of the, the normal controls and the mild cognitive impairment group. Um, and the other thing that's really interesting for us is that um, shown on the right, that, that the amount of clutter that somebody can tolerate actually correlates quite well with the um, uh, Montreal Cognitive Assessment. Um, so it does seem to be predicting not just a difference between the groups, but actually the, the MOCA scores. Um, when we look at what's happening for that same task now plotting in terms of these ERPs that I mentioned before, folk response potentials, um, you can again see there's quite a clear difference between the uh, normal controls and the mild cognitive impairment group. Um, it says MCI AD just because there's a couple of very early Alzheimer's folks in there as well, but if you remove them, you still have the same sort of effect. Um, so again, it's a, a seen mostly in terms of a delay in the timing. Um, the face task I've described to you before, um, what we can see is that uh, you have in terms of the um, behavior, there's a slight difference maybe for the uh, for the mild cognitive impairment versus the uh, normal control, it's not a huge effect. Um, but when we look at the effects in terms of the EEG in this case, um, we do see both a, uh, a delay in, in that negative going peak uh, that I mentioned before, the N170, um, as well as a tightening of the amplitude so it doesn't go down quite as far. So um, in this case, we see a difference on between the groups in terms of the uh, in terms of the EEG results, but not the behavior. In the first one we saw for both. Uh, in the case of optic flow, so which direction is something headed? Um, what we can see here is um, this, this slight uh, difference in terms of the two groups that um, you have a little bit more um, 
you need a little bit more of, of coherence or all the dots moving in one direction for the mild cognitive impairment group, but it's not, not really a huge effect. The spread is pretty similar. Um, and, but again, in terms of the EEG, we see that there's a, a slight difference again here, so that there's a slowing of um, the signals, uh, brain processing for the mild cognitive impairment group versus the other, as well as the dampening of the amplitude. And finally, with respect to the biological motion task, again, this is just uh, what direction is someone moving, and we've got different numbers of dots on the background uh, for different kinds of clutter, again, or we can do the emotion recognition and, and the person looks like they're happy or they're sad or they're angry, you've got to say which of those were they. Um, in that case, what you can see is, um, again, here uh, on the left versus the right, um, not, not huge differences for the um, just what direction things, things are going, um, bigger effects for the emotion discrimination. Um, and uh, not a lot in either of these cases going on in terms of the EEG signals. So in some cases, behavior is driving effects. In some cases, it's uh, EEG is driving effects and so on and so forth. And what's shown here is just sort of an overall summary of different um, behavioral sorts of uh, results. Um, and the MOCA is shown on the top there. So you can see that the MOCA correlates quite well with your threshold for performance in the contraintegration task, as well as the emotional uh, walkers task. Um, and then you can see, um, you know, obviously there's a correlation between your face reaction time and your face percent correct and so on and so forth. So some of, some of them correlate with each other, but what's most important for us is where we've got these, um, you know, links between the MOCA. So for behavior, it's contour and emotion. And when we look at the um, EEG results, um, where we see the biggest effects of, of predictability would be for uh, the contour and the faces and the optic flow. So there's different patterns of activity with contour being sort of implicated by both and others by just one or the other. So we, we're hopeful that that kind of approach is gonna help us you know, um, develop early detectors. Um, and what we're hopeful is that not just for MCI versus uh, uh, people who, who um, are healthy, but even before then, because we do see this nice correlation um, with, with the MOCA. So we're in the process of, of completing a much larger trial now um, where we're gonna be able to go out and test people remotely. And I'll come back to that in a second. Um, but the last thing I just wanna finish with is, you know, what about these people who are already living in long-term care that they've got advanced dementia? And um, what we think we can do, uh, one of the things that as soon as um, the latest outbreak is over, we'll be starting to test, is to use these kinds of techniques to effectively read the minds of folks who are in uh, long-term care. And, and the reason we want to do that is, and starting with vision, is because there are all of these kinds of great tools and interventions that are possible now for people living in long-term care, um, including virtual reality and so on. But if you can't see, um, then that kitten is not as much fun to look at. And it turns out that there's not a whole lot of assessment of people's vision um, in long-term care because it's hard to do. So what we're trying are ways that we can help assess people's vision in long-term care so that we can make sure that they've got the best quality of life. And the way that we're doing that is not by asking them these same kind of questions because we tried that and people with really advanced dementia can't remember what the task is from one trial to the next. It's basically impossible to do these kinds of tasks. So what we did was we turned to the kinds of approaches that are taken in developmental uh, psychology, developmental vision science. Um, and we'll, we will be again using a portable EEG system that we can bring into um, the community or into long-term care homes. Um, and um, it won't, it likely will not be uh, the news, but, but something that's you know, equally portable and easy. Um, and um, what we really wanna be able to do is to measure their brain waves. And the reason we want to do that is, is um, not, not just to sort of see, um, you know, what's their average resting state brainwave, but how, are, how is their brainwave changing when they're doing different kinds of tasks? And, and in particular, we want to measure um, the steady state visual evoked potential, which is um, a way of, of using EEG signals uh, to be able to tag one stimulus versus another, if you will, and to be able to tell if the brain can, can discriminate between those two um, stimuli. So, so um, without going into details, there's different ways of doing it. One is to sort of have one kind of a stimulus that's 
flashing at a certain rate and another sort of stimulus is flashing at a different rate. And then you're looking for um, markers in the time frequency domain for each of those. If the brain can discriminate them, you'll see distinct markers. And if it can't, then you won't. And there are ways that we can do this for um, basic sorts of vision, um, as well as for issues related to face perception. So that's one of the things that we are working on now. And the last thing I'll just mention is that we've just published a paper with Rita Orji's group um, and, and Renit Desai, who's a terrific graduate student we've been co-supervising out of Dalhousie. Um, where we've now um, launched Santrakis, which is our cross-platform tool for online EEG experiments. So everyone's been moving to online studies. Uh, and um, we noticed that there was a dearth of EEG research because it's hard to do in people's homes. And we now have a way, if people are interested, happy to share more information on this, um, to be able to take uh, any sort of, um, you know, psychopi experiment that's been done and turn it into an EEG experiment. Uh, and so what we're hoping is we can enable wide scale community based EEG and this is also foundational to be able to monitor people's health um, and and have them be able to track uh, their own brain health and take control of their their health uh, going forward. Um, and our ultimate goal um, is really uh, just to understand what's happening with age, not all aspects of vision change equally. Uh, older visual systems are especially challenged by factors like timing and clutter and multitasking. We do see some compensatory reorganization with age that protects some visual functions. Um, aging and uh, cognitive decline obviously are constraining compensation. And we also think that the aging eyes provide insights into aging brains. We think we can use information about vision to um, help us in early detection of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. We think we can use it also for new approaches of assessing vision in more advanced um, Alzheimer's disease. Um, and we also think that understanding all of that is really critical for uh, enhancing both virtual care and quality of life and long-term care. Um, and our ultimate goal is really just to make sure everyone can live longer, live better, and live more. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you for a fascinating talk. I really enjoyed it. Thank you again for accepting our invitation and giving a wonderful presentation. Uh, let's everyone... Join me, uh, join me in a virtual round of applause, thanking our speaker. Um, and uh, also people in the audience, you can, uh, if you have any questions, you can raise your hands or type your questions in the Q&A box. And if you raise your hands, we can uh, unmute you and uh, you can ask your questions. So I see one raised hand at the moment, uh, Jean-Francois, um, uh, if you can unmute yourself and uh, ask, that'd be great. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, thank yes. you. Uh, uh, I just had a question about the uh, motion task. So um, how large was the uh, the uh, coherence task with, for motion? How, how large was the visual angle? I'm, I'm just wondering whether it is in fact not an optic flow task, but a motion sort of object motion. Um, and, and that's related to a second question that I have, because uh, I, I, in my mind, optic flow would not fall in the same category as um, integration for object recognition or object motion, probably be more processing along the accessory optic system, which would be subcortical. Um, so my, my second question follows, uh, uh, do, do you think there's a way to look at changes at the subcortical level? Uh, especially specifically with optic flow. So it's a convoluted question, but I can break it down if 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 you need me to. Yeah, I don't have I don't have the numbers on me in terms of the size, but it was um, it wasn't just sort of central and, and foveal. It was it was larger, um, and and we've done quite a lot of work in the past looking at the effect of size um, on performance of a whole bunch of different kind of motion tests. And in fact, there are quite big differences. When you have small small stimuli in the middle versus quite large ones, and, right? And yeah. So so ours ours was a larger, uh, including um, elements of the periphery. Are and, we talking and, about nine? About at least ninety degrees. I mean, optic flow is quite large. Oh oh, it'll be smaller smaller than that because um, we we are also constrained by how close people can be to the screen to focus. Um, right. So yeah, so it's not going it's not going to be foveal, but it's not going to be super peripheral, but it's 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 broad enough that other people um, doing the physiology on it have shown that 
the parts of the brain that are 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 impacted by this kind of of task are sort of more middle middle temporal and parietal cortices. Um, and you can one quick follow up with that: yeah. it, it, Were your participants uh, um, uh, feeling vexation? Um, not so much. So this is it's a it's a global motion task. I, I think maybe it's a way of putting it more so than a. I mean, I did my thesis on optic flow uh, way back in the day. So yeah, in those cases, you can actually feel as though you're yeah. moving uh, if, it, if it's really full field, but we're not working with full field. So this is more, we still call it optic flow because there is no, you know, it, it is an optic flow stimulus, um, but it's not gonna necessarily induce a feeling of motion. Um, so what we're what we're really looking at here is the, the thing that's important for us is how well people can integrate information across the individual dots um, so instead of so some of the dots are moving coherently, and then there's some others that are moving with a little bit of noise that's in them. So it's really about trying to integrate across the scene. So for us, it's really an integration across the motion. So well, one, one last question, and then uh, I'll leave you alone. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so my, my, my concern about the separation of, of really optic flow and motion. So if we're dealing with a motion task that is sort of object centric, then you know MTMST will deal with that as well as well as it does with optic flow. The difference is that optic flow does have a heavy reliance on the accessory optic system, but but sends all the way to the cerebellum, which the object motion doesn't have. So I I, I think I think there's a little bit of convoluting those two is, is we need to separate those two because someone who's aging might have trouble with recognizing. Uh, movement of objects, whereas optic flow is more of an automatic process, and it would be relevant for gait, for example, to know yep. if aging yep. how it affects optic flow separate from object motion. Yeah, I think we'd really need like a cave or something to be able to do um, the full field studies, right? So uh, the, um, uh, the the because as I said, we can't have this the stimulus. Right on top of the mm -hmm. older observers, yeah, and yeah. they can't they can't focus properly unless we want to give them artificial pupils, dilate their pupils, like the kind of things I did in my thesis. That's not fun for older people. So, um, and you certainly can't do that on a on you know on a you know on a five minute task. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. I mean, so, so our task is really it's it's global motion types of optic flow. It's not it's not necessarily meant to be inducing. It's still um, you know termed optic flow because it has the elements of you can tell it's moving in a different direction and so on and it has, it has that focal point, but it's not gonna induce vection. So I think that the work in our particular sort of stimulus is really more MT, MSD, IPL, um, as opposed to the, the broader kinds of systems that you're talking about for the full field. Okay, sounds but good. But it'd be really, interesting, be really interesting to look and see you know what's happening um, in a cave or something, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. With, At the subcortical yeah. level also would be interesting to see. Yeah, for sure. the, the Polvino system. Yeah. Thank you. It's a few minutes past one. I know some people, uh, a lot of people need to leave for other uh, meetings and so on. Are you okay with answering a couple more questions? If sure. Is that okay? Okay. So there's one question in the QA box, and uh, other people in the audience, you can type in your questions too if you have any. The question is I, I believe this is from Lois. I'm not sure. It says, is asking about the difficulty of recruiting uh, 6,000 participants and the logistics of that. It was super easy because um, we were working with the company uh, Interaxon and these were people who already bought the Interaxon system, the Muse system for their mindfulness meditation studies. And uh, so we were actually just, uh, and they'd clicked a box saying you can use our data for, for research. So we were just given access to 6,000 people uh, awesome. to be able to do the work. And, um, but you know, it has gotten easier to do online studies in general. Uh, so, you know, we've been able in other behavioral studies to, to recruit, you know, a couple hundred per day uh, for some of the sorts of studies that we're doing. And, you know, the hope with this Santrakis approach for studying EEG, adding that EEG component in, is that um, because there are so many commercial devices that are out there now, like the Muse, that people have, if we can, you know, have, um, you know, recruit musers, if you will, for that, uh, then we'll be able to recruit maybe not 6,000 in one day, which is basically what we were able to do. Uh, but, uh, you know, to be able to recruit hundreds and hundreds um, every day, because it's, it's something, things that are being used around the world. And uh, so we're working right now to, to refine that system and to be able to make sure it's compatible with more at-home commercially available EEG systems. Um, I should say, 
um, interaxon itself um, has become quite interested in in starting to support researchers in in accessing uh, and in doing studies uh, and and you know so we're we're working with them right now on how to help them build that system um, so that you know more people can be engaging in in this wild neuroscience. Cool. I have a quick follow up question related to this. Um, I really love your research and studies on trying to identify the uh, variability in older adults, like distinguishing uh, MCI versus healthy and so on. But because you have so much data from several thousand people, I was wondering if there are any demographic uh, features that correlate with, uh, say, MCI versus healthy or performance on these different cognitive tests. Yeah, we don't have 6,000, I should say, we don't have 6,000 MCI versus healthy. We don't have that. Um, that's what we'd like to be able to do, right? So about, that's one of the conversations you and I are gonna have is what other kinds of information is, is there? So, um, you know, at the Rotman in general, one of the things we're really interested in is, is how do we do sort of predictive neuroscience for precision aging? But we don't want to be looking just at what's happening in MRI or EEG or those things. We do want to be looking at these other kinds of factors, um, including, um, you know, uh, blood work, including socioeconomic status, including education, work history, I mean, the environment. So we really want to think about the whole person as much as possible. And, and there is a recent paper that just came out that suggests that um, although structural MRI and uh, um, sort of neuro, neuropsychological tests seem to be predictive. Um, functional magnetic resonance imaging, at least certain kind of tests are less predictive of dementia. So um, it's, it's also clear that not every single test is gonna work the same way. And you saw that in our data too. For some things, it's the behavior drives it more and for other things, it's the EEG. Um, and sometimes it's the com combination. So that's really where we are now. We What we're trying to do in the next stage is to really scale that up and start adding in these other dimensions that you're talking about and then see how we can use that in this predictive neuroscience capacity. Yeah, that would be really interesting to work together and as a uh, try to investigate us. Um, thank you again for a wonderful talk and for staying up, uh, staying late, uh, almost ten minutes <laughs> after the. Uh, yeah, sorry, I went times. so long. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, that, that's perfect. Thank you for staying late and answering all the questions. Uh, so, people in the audience, please join me in another virtual round of applause to thank our speaker. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Bye. Bye.